Today we're going to continue our journey on international cannabis and specifically focus on the Czech Republic and Colombia. We're going to be speaking to Thomas Walker from Walker Cultivation, who's going to talk about his experience cultivating in the region of Colombia with licensed producers, as well as what's happening in the Czech Republic considering he lives there. Uh, we're going to focus on patient access, access of what type of products are available, as well as look at things like the INCB limits associated to these countries and several other aspects. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, Thomas. It's great to have you on today for discussion. I know the last time we spoke in person in this uh, COVID world was during our trip in Mexico last year, June, July. Um, and I know today we're going to really tackle the Colombian market or Colombian market as well as the Czech Republic. But I really wanted to find out before we get into that, um, what really drew you into working as a professional in the cannabis industry? Well, thanks for having me on, first of all, Jeff. Um, and when I was younger, I actually experimented a lot with smoking cannabis. And for me, cannabis was a way to really appreciate those things that I take for granted every day. And being present is actually one of them. It allows me to appreciate that, that I usually overlook simple things like birds in flight, the rumble and crack of thunder and lightning on a hot summer's evening, the sheer wonder of the night sky through a telescope and the amazing ability of cannabis to make food taste amazing. The biggest problem I had was actually finding quality cannabis. Uh, it could be found, but it was very difficult uh, to find actually a supplier who could produce top quality cannabis consistently. And being illegal made it even more difficult. Um, so uh, when I was uh, in high school, one of my friends told me that he wanted to get rid of some Swazi gold seedlings, um, and it was an opportunity I jumped on. I wanted to learn as much as possible about this plant, and it looked nothing like any other plant that I'd ever seen before. The variance and complexity of the smells were sweet, earthy, and sometimes even toxic, but inviting at the same time. And the, different, the amount of different genotypes was also staggering to me, so I was intrigued. And I took it upon myself to cultivate the most fragrant, stickiest, potent cannabis available. Now, um, over 22 years later, and I still have an immense passion for cultivating cannabis. Only now, after founding my cultivation consultancy, um, I, I'm able to actually cultivate on much larger scales for my clients. And uh, that's in many different parts of the world. And it's been a wild and rewarding uh, journey uh, that I think is far from finished. No, awesome, hundred percent. And I believe you're based in the Czech Republic at the moment. Yes, I took the leap over um, in 2020 uh, to come over, and basically, I wanted to get myself involved in the European market. You know, we can all see that, um, even though that the legislation is rolling out, might be rolling out slow, but I wanted to get myself entrenched into Europe and uh, and take advantage of the industry here. Yeah, I mean, the Czech Republic is interesting because I know they decriminalized to some extent in 2010. And then I think medical took its framework in around 2013. Um, could you tell yeah. us a bit about, you know, I know there's some limits on plant counting and access to seeds. How does it look uh, in, in the Czech Republic at the moment? Well, you know, as you said, in 2010, the Czech Republic decriminalized the possession of uh, 10 grams um, for individual users and the cultivation of up to five plants. Um, now, in January 2013, as you also stated, medical cannabis bill was passed uh, to allow patient accents. And they started with cannabis production um, to import actually cannabis in uh, a Czech Republic for the first year, just to basically maintain standards. And then after that, they uh, gave domestic production the green light. Now, since the 1st of January 2022, doctors are able to prescribe medical cannabis to their patients electronically, which is quite nice. And uh, the THC percentage has tripled from previous years and level, should I say. Uh, physicians are also able to prescribe up to 180 grams of dried cannabis per month, and that is a maximum of 30 grams per patient. Wow. Now, currently, there are about 200 doctors that are entitled to prescribe cannabis throughout the Czech Republic. And uh, when it comes to seeds, which you were mentioning, um, they're freely available, and it's absolutely no criminal offense to purchase or own seeds in the Czech Republic. Okay, no, that's awesome. I mean, I'd seen data from one of the main headline agencies that essentially the Czech Republic had grown from somewhere around 400 patients in 2019 to about 4,600 uh, consuming, you know, it wasn't, uh, it's always hard to lock down the consumption numbers, but at least over 100 kilograms uh, amongst those 4,600 patients. So for me, that's really interesting. In, and, and what was most surprising was that I think up to 90% of that was reimbursed by the state uh, itself. But how is the medical structure around, you know, the state's involvement, access to medicines within the Czech Republic? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely correct, Jeff. The, the Czech VZP health system covers 90% of the price of prescription for that maximum 30 grams of consumer per month. 
Uh, and as you pointed out, that's a 10 times increase in patient count in two years. Now, according to the Czech News Agency, the treatment that, that, that these, these patients have received actually uh, contributed to the health uh, and well-being of 69% of those patients, um, which is a really good number. It's obviously being very well received. Now, with regards to producers, uh, there's one company uh, in the whole Czech Republic who supplies all of those patients, and the company's name is CMH, or Czech Medical Herbs. Um, they are the sole producers, importers, uh, and distribution company for medicinal cannabis here in the Czech Republic. And they were the first company in 2013 um, to attain their import manufacturing and distribution licenses. Okay. Now, I've, I've also heard recently that uh, there will be um, there will be space for additional producers in the cannabis market to enter, uh, and hopefully that will create a more competitive marketplace. Well, that was my question. I could get some monopolies, you know, whenever there's a state funded, state supported. Look, it's great that the mm. patient numbers is going up, but, you know, potentially even more patients can see a raise if there's more competitive price points, but not just that, the state would benefit. So this brings me to the next question I have, maybe in terms of, you know, CBD is quite accessible in South Africa for the most part as a complementary medicine. How is access to things, maybe not THC products, but CBD products? How does it look within the Czech Republic? Is it viable? How does the industry place itself? Look, you can find CBD products almost everywhere here in the Czech Republic. And um, the one thing I will tell you, though, you can get CBD in almost every product, but the only product that you can't have CBD in, funnily enough, is e-cigarettes or vape pens. That is not legal at this point in time. Um, you can also find many tourist traps, particularly in, a, in the capital Prague, where I stay. Um, which sell CBD products, but the products they vend are of extremely low quality on and are actually realistically meant for souvenir purposes. However, there are dedicated CBD stores and actually vending machines all over the place um, throughout Prague, which can distribute CBD buds, trenches, topicals, and so forth. No, awesome, awesome. And I know we're also going to speak about Colombia because you've got a lot of cultivation experience in there and we spoke about that in Mexico. But before we jump to Colombia, I wanted to ask you, Hemp is an area that's obviously sustainable hemp cultivation. Is there any really, pro really progressive progress in the Czech Republic from what you've seen uh, regarding hemp? Yeah, um, but from what I know, um, it's not very active. And okay. that may be due to a few different factors. What I do know is that recently legislation was amended for the increase of the THC content in those hemp genotypes. And this is going to help basically for the producers uh, to create a more a hardier genotypes of hemp, uh, which will have increased resistance to pests, pathogens, climactic conditions, and those type of things. But from what I understand at this point in time, uh, hemp is not very active. There are one or two producers, but it's not a very big thing here in Czech Republic. And I'm pretty sure that it could be also due to uh, the uh, seasons that we have here, which is they, they're around the five to zero degrees. And, you know, um, hemp doesn't do well in those conditions. <laughs> no, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but, you know, this raises, so for me, it makes me just reflect because I know that Czech Republic, Switzerland, Malawi, these are three countries that all align their THC to 1% uh, as a threshold, which is good, progressive. I mean, we've seen in Africa the, the argument around the 0.2% based on just where we are climatically. Yeah. So, no, it's good to see that at least the, the thinking around it is aligned with the 1%. And that's why the Czech Republic was stood out immediately for me in terms of hemp. And I had to ask the question. But now let's jump to Colombia. Colombia is obviously the market that went live in 2016 a lot of foreign investment into the space um tell me a bit more about your involvement in the the cultivation activities in colombia like just give us a bit more of context around the market and how you see it there well you know as uh, as you've stated there you know in 2004 colombia decriminalized personal use um and in 2015 the supreme court um, allowed for personal cultivation of up to 20 plants um, in 2015, I think it was, cannabis legislation was enacted uh, to start commercial production, import, export, and all those type of things. Um, Colombia has actually seen a huge number of license applicants since 2015, that is. Um, as of tw uh, February 2020, uh, they processed over 600 licenses. Um, but there are problems. Um, unfortunately, due to license issues, and that is particularly around cultivar registrations and the commercialization quotas, the industry in Colombia has basically stalled. Um, only genetics that are registered with the Colombian Agricultural Institute can be used for commercial purposes, and the process is a super lengthy one. It involves growing a particular cultivar from start to finish, and then having yield, cannabinoid profile, and other technical information audited 
uh, to basically confirm its origin. And I can tell you right now from the research that I've done, only four out of 100 plus licensed operators currently have registered cultivars with, uh, with Colombia. Now on the ground, producers are mainly researching and developing and that's where I've basically come in. Um, and, that's not, and that's basically because not one commercialization quota has been issued to date. And the only product, product that actually has been exported out of Colombia at this stage has been for research purposes only. So my involvement in uh, all of Colombia at this point in time has just been on setups uh, for R&D projects um, to basically get uh, the right cultivars in and to register cultivars with uh, the Colombian uh, Agricultural Institute to actually start production, which is a major hurdle, you know, uh, to get your production down and, and to get it operational. No, hundred percent. I mean, I, I when I think of Colombia, I think of uh, pri primarily free companies. I think of Clever Leaves that's been quite active, and they had the EU GMP approval for export of finished products. And we'll talk about the amendments done by the presidency regarding uh, the export of flour, which took the world by storm towards the end of last year, yeah. uh, or maybe middle of last year onwards. Uh, I think of Chiron. I think of Pharmacilio. These are some of the companies I, I might have had some engagements with, or at least heard of in the region that are active. Uh, what's unique about Colombia from my perspective, when I look around at different regulations around the world, is specifically also this 1% comes up again, because in Colombia, they split their licensing into four parts, which is obviously cannabis derivatives, uh, for one part, the sourcing around seeds, uh, the other license type of framework, and then psychoactive and non-psychoactive licenses. Uh, where obviously, if you're looking for hemp under 1% THC, that forms as non-psychoactive and over 1% is psychoactive. And that's where most of the interest has been generated from foreign investment looking at it is, how do they capitalize around that? Uh, but again, it's always that question of like, can you get it aligned to be an appropriate GACP flower and then maybe ship that to a European destination for GMP yes. processing? Yes, you know, it's those kind of questions that really is, I mean, it's tough. I mean, we know also in Africa because it's similar in some regards, uh, you know, getting that full, full turnkey GMP and EU GMP is, is a tough ask. So in a way, we're going to get around to the presidency changing on the flower. But, you know, it's something that I, I find the region interesting because there's almost some parallels in terms of that, you know, it starts, it stalls, it starts, it stalls. And I feel Africa sometimes represents almost a similar experience uh, in terms of domestic access in the region. I mean, let's maybe start with, you know, when you were there, how, in terms of CBD products, uh, how accessible was CBD products? And then we'll jump next to THD products. Look, um, it's it's sort of emerging at this point in time. CBD cosmetics, pharmaceutical products, and dietary supplements are available almost everywhere, but they're very stringent on uh, on the testing. There's a there's a specified company, or sorry, sh should I say, government organisation that needs to check every single product that comes out there and actually uh, certify it for um, sale. So um, it's difficult, but but it is pushing forward. Okay, good. And then on the THC front, I mean, I've heard of clinics, I've heard of prescriptions. I necessarily haven't heard of for what indications, but could you give us a bit of the context around uh, how extensive those pharmacies are and the scale of uh, that access for THC? Yeah, I mean, the scale is quite good. They are, they're deploying very, very well. Doctors can prescribe high THC products, of course, um, and prescriptions are actually required. Uh, patients have access to both THC and CBD cultivars. And this is through a network of over 14,000 pharmacies in 350 different cities. So the network is out there. Okay, awesome. Well, that's good to see. I mean, for me, that kind of that does raise the, you know, the final question I have. I mean, we're going to talk maybe lastly about the INCB and how that relates to these developing territories. But, um, you know, the amendments around the export of flour, uh, they're trying to push from a Colombian perspective to legitimize cannabis as an agricultural export and a pharmaceutical export, um, and along with obviously the work they've done with coffee and general flowers. How do you see that move in terms of really enabling, do you think it will get Colombian businesses off the ground if they're now able to export GACP flour to, let's call it Northern Hemisphere territories from the equatorial zones? Yes, I think it's a step in the right direction. I mean, when they first came out with the draft re legislation for producers, they were only allowed to export oil, which is crazy, uh, you know. Um, and I think it's definitely in the step in the right direction. I mean, uh, to basically force producers to ship out oil instead of actually bud um, is crazy because you're cutting your profits heavily when you convert bud to oil. 
I mean, we all basically know that it's uh, that if you've got good bud, you've got a 10 to 1 ratio. So if you've got 10 grams of bud, you can make about one gram of oil. Um, and when you do the costings on both of those things, you lose a lot of money when you convert to oil, especially from bud, where a lot of producers, what they do prudently is use trim to create oil. Um, then you do, then you can obviously sell your bud at a good price. Um, I think it's a good way to go, but um, as we have discussed, I think there's a lot of other problems um, in the pipeline for Colombia um, in terms of the legislation um, going forward. And, um, you know, um, uh, the destruction of cannabis or of cannabis plants is another problem there as well, and that hasn't been addressed. You know, destruction of cannabis plants in any stage of production is not permitted at this point. And it's a problem because not all pro uh, plants in a production perform optimally. And that's why cultivators like myself, we always produce excess plants. We cull those that underperform and we only keep the, uh, the, the plants that produce our desired results. Um, now, you were speaking about the INCB earlier as well. Now, another point to consider is, is the quotas um, for Colombia. Now, in 2019, the INCB um, estimated that for 2020, Saka Active Cannabis um, produced in Colombia was going to atone for about 1.95 tons. Now, this is a far cry um, that they estimated for 2019, which was 40 tons. So, I mean, there's many hurdles to overcome for Colombia at this point. Um, which was once actually considered the jewel of South America for cannabis production. Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, the INSB is something I've been actively engaging with the Secretariat there to find out more about what's going on because I know that Colombia is sitting on 128 tons for an estimate for this year, 2022, uh, just behind Canada. But Canada, I think, is over 200 tons. Uh, but they've also got a lot of inventory that needs to move. Yeah. Uh, I need to check South Africa. I know the Czech Republic was at about 200 kilograms, which makes sense based on that patient number base we spoke about. And hopefully South Africa has moved upwards from the 500 kilogram. But uh, there are some recent shipments I've seen that also gone through South Africa. So that's surely to have moved up. So no, thank you, Thomas. I can only uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for speaking to the actual markets we've addressed today, the Czech Republic and Colombia. Uh, it's great that you're in the Czech Republic and give updates to the region. So I'll definitely be reaching out more. And I look forward to engaging more because I know you've got a lot of cultivation experience. Uh, that's fantastic to tap yeah. into. So it's absolutely a pleasure to have had you on. And I'm looking forward to uh, our next engagement and our next discussions in the you know global cannabis arena. And uh, yeah, till then, I just want to say thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Always a pleasure. Excellent. Now, if you enjoyed that discussion as much as I did, be sure to also have a look at the discussion I had with Lucas Roth regarding cannabis in Germany.